which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Thank you for praying. We've just done a lot of good in the world by our prayers. I want to take just a, a moment to focus our attention on Glory House. I had attempted to have somebody from Glory House come and be with us this morning, but we weren't able to make those arrangements, so I'm afraid you're stuck with me for just a few seconds here. And Glory House, if, in case you uh, don't know who Roger Fredrickson is, he was uh, an American Baptist pastor of our denomination who pastored at uh, First Baptist Church uh, here in Sioux Falls. And uh, one of the many things that Roger did during his time here was to initiate a new ministry called Glory House. And the ministry of Glory House is to provide transitional housing for people who are attempting to overcome addictions, who've had a tough time in life and are looking for a helpful hand up. And Glory House helps to provide that. Their facilities are located in, I guess I would call it the south central part of Sioux Falls, uh, just a little ways north of the interstate. Um, what's the hard what's the Grace. Grace. By the ice skating rink? I never go there. <laughs> what's that? 40, uh, 49th and Grange. 49th and Grange, okay, yeah. Yeah, oh, well, there you are, Costco. Everybody knows where that is. Uh, so anyway, in that part of town, and they have recently uh, built some new facilities to help extend their ministry. So what we're going to ask of you today is, is consider what you might give or how you might help uh, with Glory House. We'll have some um, uh, advisory board members at the back of the church. They'll have some baskets, and if you... Uh, want to make a contribution, we will accept that on behalf of Glory House today. Um, but I, otherwise, I would advise you to, uh, when you get home, look it up on your computer. Go to the website, become familiar, and, and get more information than, than what I've given you this morning. Uh, but it is uh, something that's very worthwhile. Now, the other reason I'm mentioning that today is that it's our uh, practice here at Emmanuel Baptist to name uh, a ministry partner a different one each month. And uh, in that way, we hope to uh, be able to be connected uh, with the other service providers in our community and uh, extend the ability to meet needs here in Sioux Falls. Amen? All right, now I have some really good news for you. Helen has come to share with us a special ministry today. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
They did not lie or cheat. They walked with me, living good and righteous lives, and they turned many from lives of sin. The words of a priest's lips should preserve knowledge of God, and people should go to him for instruction, for the priest is the messenger of the Lord of heaven's armies. But you priests have left God's paths. Your instructions have caused many to stumble into sin. You have corrupted the covenant I made with the Levites, says the Lord of heaven's armies. So I have made you despised and humiliated in the eyes of all the people. For you have not obeyed me, but have shown favoritism in the way you carry out my instructions. The Lord has brought this word of correction to his people. May it be for us a word of correction and instruction as God reveals to us where we need to change. Now I'm trying to remember those of you who can go back far enough in your experience, can help me. What was Jackie Gleason's job on the honeymooners? Bus driver. Bus driver. I thought so. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to tell you a little story, and in your mind, I want you to see Jackie Gleason driving the bus. Jackie Gleason driving a tour bus. And you are riding on the tour bus that Jackie Gleason is driving. And I imagine it's super entertaining because, well, it's Jackie Gleason. So we're riding on the bus and Jackie is driving and suddenly the bus comes to a stop in a small town and uh, he turns the engine off after parking the bus, of course. He turns around in his seat and says, hey folks, We'll be stopping here for 20 minutes. This line makes it a strict policy never to recommend an eating place by name. But if anybody wants to see me while we're here, I'll be eating a wonderful T-bone steak with French fries at Tony's first class, spotlessly clean diner directly across the street. And with that remark, picks himself up out of the driver's seat and walks into the restaurant. There's more than one way to guide folks, aren't there? What the company prohibited, our bus driver found a way around. And sometimes we need people to guide us, to point us in the right direction. We need a guide who's been there where we want to go so he can lead us there. And in Old Testament times, the people who were supposed to provide that kind of guidance for the people of faith was the priests. They're like the bus drivers showing us where to eat. It was their duty to interpret and apply the word of God, and they led in worship, and they also taught the people. They were mediators who filled in the gap between God and his people. That's in the Old Testament times. In the New Testament times, things have changed. We have Jesus Christ as our mediator. And we require no priest to serve as the go-between between each of us individually and our God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that all of us who believe, who have faith in Jesus, we are a priest. We are our own priest. And also that we function as a priest for others outside the faith to try to encourage them to come and join 
in this journey of faith. So what we're about to read may at first glance seem to not apply. Let me assure you, it applies to each of us. And here's what we need to learn today, folks. We must not resist the truth. We must hear God's word and obey God's will. As people of faith, we do not resist the truth. As a matter of fact, we do the opposite. We accept it. We proclaim it. We share it. Three things to look at this morning. We'll go through these briefly. The first is the call to heed God's warning. Verses 1 to 4. Malachi brought a warning to the priests who served the people of God at that time. This section is aimed directly at the priests. And as we said, these are the mediators. These are the people who intervened on uh, God's behalf in the lives of the people. We as believers now take on that responsibility for ourselves. Jesus is the high priest and we are priests serving under him. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, in Malachi's time, these priests were guilty of not honoring God. They did not honor God. Now remember last week we talked about sacrifices. And if a, a sacrifice was brought in that was defective in some way, it was not supposed to be offered to God. And at one point, Malachi said that the sacrifices, uh, some of them were so defective because they were stolen. And this week we learned that maybe some of these priests were in the habit of taking in a perfectly good animal as a sacrifice and then putting him off to one side and then substituting a, a blemished or disqualified kind of animal to be sacrificed instead and keeping the good one. They were keeping the good stuff for themselves. In some cases, uh, they, they taught the wrong things, and in, as we'll learn in a bit, some cases they showed favoritism among the worshipers. The seriousness of any offense is revealed by the level of punishment it deserves. And that's just true in life in general. The seriousness of an offense is gauged in part by the degree of punishment it deserves. And so look, listen to the kind of punishment that God is dealing out to these priests who did not take him seriously. He says in verse 2, I'm going to turn your blessings into curses. I'm not just going to curse you. I'm going to turn the blessings into curses. And then in verse 3, something truly gross. And this is where the message now gets kind of PG level. The threat there in verse 3 is that he's going to rub manure in their faces. Yuck. That's terrible. But it's worse. You see, the word for manure there includes all of the rejected parts of the sacrifice. They didn't offer the whole animal to God. There were certain body parts, there were organs and, and things that were removed from the sacrifice and piled up somewhere nearby until they could be thrown away. So this is a reference to a pile of bloody goo and awful stuff. And God says, your disobedience is so disgusting. I think this disgusting punishment fits the crime. And then, just to make matters worse, he says, I'm going to toss you in the manure pile. I don't know if you've ever been near a manure pile, but it's not a place you want to set up a lawn chair. When, when we lived in Vermont, we, there was, uh, often this stuff was kept and then sprayed on the fields. And my father 
in law when one of those wagons went by, manure spreaders, he'd say, smells like money to me. <laughs> Oddly, it didn't smell like money to the rest of us. So it, it puts this whole thing in a, in a very disgusting, awful sort of thing. And God wants us to know that sin is serious, but it's also awful. It's also disgusting. Now he says in this passage that the purpose of the punishment, the good purpose of the punishment, was to maintain the covenant between God and the priests. And he says that directly. Maintain the covenant, the agreement between God and the priests. How does that work? Well, punishment is a teaching method. It causes some pain so that we will pay attention to our sin and we will be motivated to repent. And if you're a parent dealing with a child, uh, especially a young child, that's the most effective way of reaching their heart. And so God had warned them that the day of punishment for this terrible behavior was coming. It restored the covenant then because they would repent. They would seek God's forgiveness. And we know, friends, that um, re repentance and forgiveness is the repair work of all our relationships. From time to time, we offend one another. And we have to uh, ask for forgiveness. We have to be restored into relationship. So that's the, uh, how this was aimed directly at the prof, uh, priests. Secondly, God calls us to show reverence for him in the way we live, verses 5 and 6. Now, God's part of the covenant. A covenant is an agreement. It's like a contract, and each party has their parts, their things to do. God's part in the covenant in verse 5 is very plain. He said, I've done this to bring two things life and peace. He wanted to bring life and peace to the people through the priests. But because the priests were unrepentant sinners, because they disobeyed God, they were not able to be that, life, that lifeline, that pipeline that would pass along the divine blessings to the people. They failed in their duty. Their priest's part and the people's part of the covenant was to do two things. One, worship God, and two, obey His laws. And throughout the whole history of Israel, as Malachi notes here, there were times when the covenant was working, when both parties were doing their parts and that the people were faithful. They had reverence for God's name. They showed awe in His presence. And there were times in the history of God's people when the priests were faithful and they did their job. Look at verse 6. He says there that they passed on the truth of the instructions they received. He says there in verse 6 that they were careful to live moral lives. That they didn't lie or cheat, but they lived good and righteous lives. There are times in the history where the system worked just the way it was supposed to. And it was good. And at those times, he says, they were successful in turning many people away from sin. So God set up a system that if it was followed would work. It would be successful. It would be productive in spiritual terms especially. But then in verses 7 to 9 we see things go the opposite way. Here the priests are called to faithfully teach the truth. And they didn't. The primary duty of a priest is to preserve knowledge of God. I want you to hear those four words. That's really key for what we're trying to do here today.
preserve knowledge of God. Against all of the attacks of the world and the falsehood of, of unbelievers and the antagonism of those who hate faith and the church and God, we need to preserve knowledge of God. Priests, like angels, served God by being his messengers. Now their failure came because they disobeyed God and they taught others to do the same. In contrast to verses 5 and 6, here in 7 and 8, we see that they did evil. They left God's paths. And second, they instructed others and they stumbled into sin. The result of this was that they had corrupted the covenant. They had failed to keep their part of the covenant. Now the punishment for this for these priests is in verse 9. He said that they would be despised and humiliated in the eyes of the people. And when you think back to the manure facial in the earlier part of the verse, gross, uh, that would be humiliating, of course. So they were despised and humiliated. Why? One reason is that that's what their sin deserved. That's the punishment that fit the crime. But the other reason is so that they would not have influence on the people, a negative influence. And so God caused them to be diminished in the eyes of the people so that they would not follow their bad example. They disobeyed God. They failed to tell the truth. And worse, they added to that the sin of favoritism. So someone would come in and confess a sin and they would require maybe a dove to atone for that sin. But then someone else that they didn't like came in and they might require a, a lamb to atone for that sin. Same sin, but favoritism being shown. We're learning this morning that we must not resist God's truth, but we must hear it and obey it. And here's one final thing about the Old Testament priests. They were all part of one family. One family. The priests were all the descendants of Levi, one of the sons of Jacob. Now, not all Levites or sons of Levi were priests, but you couldn't be a priest outside of the family of Levi. And the same can be said of us. We are one family. And we're meant to serve together. It is a distinction, it is an honor to serve God together. What's different is that everybody in this family is a priest. And here is our calling, here is our sacred duty to preserve the knowledge of God. We start by being our own priest, and we continue by being a priest to others who don't yet know Jesus as their Savior. The word for priest in Latin means bridge builder. Bridge builder. So as we function as a priest, we're building bridges between us and others. We're building bridges between others and God in order to bring them into fellowship with the one who gives them life and peace. Amen? Amen. Our purpose is to glorify the name of God as we go forth, the way we speak, the way we live, the priorities that we have, 
So I'd like you to turn to number nine, please. And let us lift up this hymn. We'll do all three verses. Would you stand? 